Hi guys, welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Hattie Morahan. I'm Hannah. And I'm Ellie and we are the co-presidents of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them out into the Q&A function, which is down at the bottom somewhere, and not the chat function, and we will read them out for you at the end. Do bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and let us know in the chat if there are any problems seeing or hearing us. Most importantly, enjoy the Q&A. So just a little introduction for our guest. Hattie is an acclaimed stage and screen actress. She was awarded the Best Actress Prize at the Critics Circle Awards and was nominated for an Olivier Award for her portrayal of Nora in A Doll's House. She's also known for her role as Jane in Outnumbered, Queen Elsmere in Alice Through the Looking Glass and the Enchantress in Beauty and the Beast. We're really honoured to have this Cambridge alumna and talented actress speak. So my first question for you, Hattie, is when did you know that you wanted to be an actor and sort of what was your first experience of film and theatre? Um, hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, I, I come from, so my, a lot of my family work in the same industry. Um, on my dad's side, very much in the design um, world, like going back generations of production design and um, my dad was a director and then my mother's an actress. So it's something I guess I was exposed to. So I had, um, I feel really fortunate about that actually. I got taken to see things and theatre was very much discussed in the household. And I guess like any family business, if you see something growing up, it, it becomes something you project yourself into. So um, I, yeah, I, I think I knew I wanted to do it or I would imagine myself doing it. Um, but then a lot of people ask you about it, Can, you know, friends of parents. So, um, you know, they would, they would ask, so in a way that if your family do something completely different, that would never even come up. And so uh, essentially I was extremely unrebellious and it was, a, it was a shared sort of love of the same field. And um, I just, yeah. And I guess just before going to, um, Cambridge there was a sense of drama school or university and my dad like had never been neither of my parents went to university and he was super my sister was already there and he was just really super keen that we we get degrees and he was so proud that we were able to sort of to get there in the first place so I think he was very much prioritizing that and thought drama school can always come later which it never did um but anyway um so yeah so I guess it was something yes I always knew I wanted to do and was really exposed to it and just fell in love with it very early on. And so did you follow that passion at Cambridge and do theatre or maybe even I film? I did. Um, possibly too much theatre and <laughs> not enough work was the kind of final conclusion I drew. Um, the first two years I did a great deal and loved it and sort of auditioned for everything and tried to do, oh goodness, two, two plays a term or something you know, at least I knew people who were doing more and um, I didn't really have the sort of chutzpah or um, capacity to to um, bluff essentially to get through the, the failure to do the work <laughs> when I should have been doing that instead of like learning lines and doing plays. Uh, so it was quite stressful. I, th I think some people really just flew and was like, I don't care, I'm juggling a hundred things, but I remember just feeling really panicky a lot of the time about work. And then in my final year, I was like, I can't continue. So I just stopped in place and tried to work. And that's felt a better place. But yeah, it's an amazing place for it. There's just so much going on, even though obviously it's not a curriculum subject and you can't study it. Um, just the m amount of opportunities and the variety of work um, and the amount of writing and people directing and figure everyone's figuring it out as they go along. And I just thought that was really joyous. And the fact that you could be doing a play with people, you know, some of the cast might be desperate to be actors and have always dreamed of it. And some people might be a scientist or a sociologist going, yeah, this is a bit of fun, but quite frankly, I've got more important thing, you know, a medic. And you're like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> like, you, you're destined for something really, really um, significant in a very different way. Um, so, yeah, I loved that element of, of being at, at college, actually. And you also directed in your time at Cambridge as well. What, what made you decide to just focus on acting and 
Um, I just directed the once and it was a sort of an idea, I guess it was just something I wanted to try. And I chose a play, a Russian farce called The Suicide um, by Nikolai Erdman that I'd seen in Edinburgh a few years before and it had just really made an impression. And I just, I guess I had a sort of psych pioneer feeling of just going, nobody knows this play. I think it's brilliant and wanting to share it and wanting to experiment, but um, it was great fun. But I think I discovered at the time, maybe it'd be different now, that I didn't quite have the personality to be a director. Like I love the intricate work between one or two actors in the scene, but that sort of, that moment when all the actors stop what they're doing and look at you and go, right, well, what are we doing now? I, I think thinking back, I was like, I think I was winging it really, but um, it was a good learning curve and really, and really fun. I was, I guess I was really proud, but, I sort of, um, I think I wasn't quite mature enough in my sense of a sort of artistic vision to really sort of feel confident with all the steps I was making in a way that might be different now. I haven't actually directed, but I sort of, I do feel a bit of a draw towards it. Towards it. So yes, it was quite easy to then go, no, no acting is the thing I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> And how did you sort of eventually get into the industry? You said you didn't go to drama school. Was it sort of contacts you made through Cambridge? Um, it was a um, combination of things. So um, I had done a television job when I was younger, when I was 16, and had got representation, which is obviously one of like the key things that you can leave university going, how on earth do I start actually getting work? So that was just so lucky and um, it meant that even though I didn't work through university I kind of I knew that there was that sort of route uh, open to me and then I left and wrote tons of letters basically I just any play I'd seen I wrote to the director any casting director I in those days it wasn't really online so you I think I had this book called contacts which had all the casting directors and I just wrote to all of them and I said, you know, this is who I am, please, please consider me, you know, would you consider, I think I had some photo done. And eventually I got a open audition at the RSC where they do a big group of people in a morning and sort of you do workshops and you sort of look at bits of the play and then they might call you back. And then at that time the season was very cross cast. So um, you sort of, if the director's keen, then you'll suddenly get a message saying, this other director wants you to go away and read these two plays tonight and come back tomorrow having prepared X, Y, and Z. And then if that goes well, then they say, go away. And this other director is interested to know, can you do this? So you sort of, you have a mad week of going backwards and forwards and just like reading plays that I was meant to have read at university and <laughs> but failed to, and, uh, and then got a job. And that was the end of, that was sort of, December, January, I think I started in January, like after leaving that, having left that summer before. So, um, and it was a really brilliant starter. It was a sort of, I had, I think I was in four plays in three different spaces, old work, contemporary writing. Um, yeah, there was a restoration of Shakespeare and two pieces of new writing. So it was like the best different different you know the big space the tiny space different directors you know understudying so it was like it was a sort of um baptism by fire really in it and i loved it yeah it sounds a bit like your kind of your own version of drama school yeah yeah it was um i don't think it taught me everything that at all that i would have learned at drama school and it's that strange thing of you leave and sorry you leave higher education and you don't really know what you don't know so I had this sense of like a bit of confidence <laughs> a bit of imagination can get you anywhere and then a few years into the industry I was like well maybe it can't maybe there are times when depending on the actor depending on their instincts and their abilities you know where you come up against your own limits and and if you haven't trained then it's hard to know what tools you can apply to um to get you through those blocks and i and i definitely had a few years of doing parts which i might have like slaved away for the audition but when it came to actually d 
delivering all the aspects of the character I kind of just go I don't know how to do this really weird leap I've got to do or whatever so um it was like a drama school in that, you know, I was working continually, being exposed to the ma most amazing voice work, verse work. Um, we put on our own fringe festival there. Um, but it was, it, you know, I, I think it's only years of experience and doing it that can finally build up that sort of toolbox that you need, really. In that respect, do you have any advice for students who would like to follow in your footsteps and become actors in terms of drama school or not drama school that sort of thing um or anything else um i find it really hard to say definitively like oh god you must go to drama school you mustn't because every single person is different and every single person's casting bracket might be different some people might come into their own in their 40s or some people you know so there I do know that there is absolutely a sense when you're leaving university of going you're looking around you're like oh my god that person is a superstar and they're only 18 or something you know <laughs> whatever especially in film and um there's a sense of like I'm missing out there I've got to get out there I've got to get out there um but I know I have friends who went through training afterwards and got masses out of it and I've got a few who went straight in and I, I think I feel really fortunate that I did one or two jobs in which I learned a great deal and I somehow managed to sort of keep going. But I, I know that this, the one sort of thing to be wary of about not training is not having the confidence to tackle anything. Um, there's something about having gone through that process, it seems, but it depends on the teaching. You, you need a really good drama school training, not, and it seems that not all of them are good, but that sounds very generalised, but you know, I know people have come out of come out of drum school sort of quite frustrated with the experience as well. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to hold the thought, the train of thought in my head, but yeah, that that just feeling equipped to have a really kind of malleable, flexible toolbox with which to approach different types of writing in a way that you could have a great deal of beginner's luck leaving university and then suddenly six or seven years into your career go, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. But saying that some people are just are born with wonderful confidence and or wonderful natural instinctive talent, which is sort of um, not something you can teach really. I think of myself as a grafter rather than somebody who's like, da -da, I can say anything that comes out of my mouth is the most watchable thing ever. I'm like, so it, it depends on <clears throat> who you are. And I know that's really not very helpful advice, but I guess something to take away from is that there's no right or wrong and maybe your route, whatever route you take, um, you can make it work, I think. That's <laughs> pretty nice. Yeah, um, with regards to the RSC, because obviously that's you know slightly more related to older work which may have its own challenges were there any specific lessons that you learned from your time there um yes there's, there's different school of thoughts about um verse speaking in this country and there's a very strong tradition um the sort of the john bart and peter hall um school of thought about being very rigorous observing the clues that Shakespeare or his contemporaries would have left in a text <clears throat> to do with the versification. And I found that really useful to know, but equally some of the most exciting performances I see on stage, you know, like the Mark Rylances of the world, what's joyous is it feels like they're literally sort of stumbling over words and mm. it's um it's you know completely spontaneous so I think there's a there's um a balance to be found and um I I think it can't harm you to I think a background in in English literature is really really valuable because you have to understand what you're saying so crucially I'd say my the key things are understand what you're saying but try it's just that thing of thinking on the line, I guess, and um, 
trying to use the incredible articulacy of these characters as a as a release as a gift rather than as something which is like you know i how i would never express things in this way like they must be a genius and they're not you know it's just like so this is the world we're in this is how they speak know what they that what know what they say picture everything it's it's kind of the same rules as any kind of acting but kind of obviously you're dealing with different materials so um if you're pick, if you're describing something on stage have it in your head um yeah, I, but I guess it, yeah, it's sort of, I guess there's a particular onus if you are doing historical material, you know, whether it's Renaissance or Restoration or something to, I feel you you want, there's no point in doing it if it, if it feels like it's sort of something from a museum, you want it to feel like people are actually talking to each other, actually listening. So it's the same rules that apply in contemporary drama, listen to each other, try not to think ahead of the line, try and just be in the moment. Um, but, you know, understand what you're saying and, and f let it, you know, fly with it. It's a gift. Yeah, brilliant. And you've been part of touring productions and also uh, sort of staying in one particular theatre. Mm. Do you have a preference um, with one or the other? And do you feel like, you know, sort of with touring companies where you're having to constantly adapt, that helps the play to evolve in a way? Um, I think... Um, tour, I think touring and playing different spaces is a really good exercise to keep yourself sort of, you have to be flexible and you can't get sort of locked into particular ways, especially if you're sort of jumping from sort of playing something in the round to playing something, you know, recently I did a production which opened at Theatre Cluid in their huge space, um, what's it called, the Harvey, I think it's called, I might have made that up, um, which is a huge amphitheatre sort of shape, vibe, um, and then transferring to a tiny, tiny venue in London on three sides. And that was a, just a really fascinating exercise in telling stories, you know, keeping tension in the different spaces. And then it was interesting talking to people who'd seen it both, how a story resonates or lands with them in different spaces. I know my partner said that he found that the, the mythic qualities of the play were so much clearer in the big space, which and they got lost in the small, but you know, there were other gains and, you know, so there are gains and losses. So I think it's really good uh, from a sort of keeping yourself very <coughs> live and not getting locked. Um, I think it can bond because if actors are away from home, it can bond a company to, to be mm. away. Um, and I think one thing I discovered a few years ago that I just hadn't anticipated is if you do a show and then they have a break from it and then you come back to it and that can be absolutely extraordinary for deepening clarity and um, sharpening the storytelling and allowing yourself to relax. So when I did a Doll's House production that we did London in three incarnations and then went to New York as well and every single time we returned to it there was less effort and less physical effort into trying to achieve certain moments. And you could just, you were suddenly like, oh, you, you could trust things and things that you couldn't quite see because you were too kind of, I think you were too stressed or it was too hectic or it was too new and you're still going, the prior time suddenly dropped into place. And it was sort of, so that was really fascinating, which I think, I guess is a form of touring of kind of take going on a journey with a, with a play. Um, but there's often a magic about, the relationship a play has with a particular audience at a particular venue and the, the team working around it. So um, they're different experiences, but um, I think there's something about sharing work to new places, new people is really exciting and touring. Definitely. Um, you then went on to work for Katie Mitchell on, I hope I'm going to say this right, Iphigenia at Aldis. Iphigenia, Aldis. but people say it in different ways, so don't worry. We called it oh. Iphigenia. In Greece, they call it Iphigenia. <laughs> so. um, and she's often seen as quite a polarising theatre director. What was it like to work with her? Um, I really loved it. Um, I first worked with her when I was fairly inexperienced and hadn't really um, encountered a very systematic approach. Um, and be because I hadn't trained, essentially, I hadn't really 
my dad had given me these Stanislavski books. Like when I was about 16, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> that looks really sort of dense. And um, so I just hadn't really sought it out for some reason. Maybe I was a bit snobbish or a bit suspicious. Like, oh, what is this sort of, you know, Stanislavski or method or whatever you'd call it. Um, and I just adored it. It was so um, methodical and straightforward and clear and, it was in a time when she was gifted the luxury of a sort of nine week rehearsal at the national. I don't know whether budgets allow for that or, you know, these things sort of shift and change, but it was a bit like going back to school and I'm just someone who really responds to um, structure and systems and order. So I just loved the fact that you could approach a text. We first did it with this uh, Greek play of Gennar and Alice and again on um, Chekhov and, <clears throat> and then new writing as well, but where you approached the material with a really clear set of exercises that just allowed you to, to eradicate fear around what you were doing, eradicate unspecific specificity, um, and just breaking it into moment by moment and really true investigation of a character's back history through the writing, through the text, um, and it, I found it very, it gave me a lot of freedom because it suddenly meant, there's a, there's a, they, it suddenly meant that you could drop all that sense of like, this is about me bringing something to the table and creating some great turn as this character. And actually you can go, my sole responsibility is I'm guardian of this character's journey. And it's not my responsibility that the whole story gets told clearly. I just act it truthfully moment by moment and the director will is looking at everything and will sort of tell me if something needs to be different. And I just love the coherence of, of the method and found the thoroughness and the, and the rigor of the work really exciting. And it was really fun. I think people have an idea of it being really doer and not at all. It was like full of giggles and full of fascinating insights about um, psychology and um, human behavior and in a really lovely way, really sort of powerful way to unlock these ancient texts as well. I, th I thought that was really, it sort of was really successful from that perspective. Because yeah. She, yeah, she's often said to use psychiatry to look into her characters, which I think seems like quite a sort of scary term, but it, that is something that you used with that play. And also when you watched her again on the seagull and the city. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Yes, I think she'd just been sort of doing some workshops with a particular neuroscientist who was exploring a particular range of human emotions and uh, the body language that, you know, we exhibit when undergoing those, those explorations of those emotions through, through improvisation. And um, it was just, I think it, the, the key to her approach in that time, and I'm sure according to the material that she's presenting and she now does a lot of multimedia work which she approaches in a slightly different way um it seems but um it's basically rather than the tradition in this country it seems with text-based theatre has always been um the the director shapes the performances to deliver maybe the arguments of a piece or deliver the story in a way that an audience can sit back and receive and know precisely what the message is that's being given them. And I suppose her approach was, and she's not the only person to sort of pioneer this. I'm, you know, I think she had sort of drawn a lot from a lot of the Russian practitioners, but um, that you, if you present human life accurately on stage and it, even if it appears to a sort of British theatre going eye to be quite unfocused and hold on, there are people with backs to the audience or it's a bit dark or, you know, but if you, if you portray it absolutely truthfully, we are all attuned in real life to observe body language, to observe how people are in groups, you know, to, to know precisely what's going on, but it requires a sort of retuning. <clears throat> so it's less presentational. Mm -hmm. much more um, uh, sort of a, a requiring the audience to 
to to find to choose who they want to look at on stage things like that really interesting um in respect of showing a a reality what was it like working with your mother as part of the cast on um t.s Eliot's family reunion yes an actual family reunion that her family reunion and also funny enough with my godmother penelope wilson is my godmother wow so um because they go back a long time so um it was a right old like oh um uh it was very lovely it's quite a tricky play i mean i think i i struggled a bit with the writing with, with sort of making it work um maybe i'd feel differently about it now but i think i was sort of sort of found it quite a challenge. Um, I think it was extraordinary what Jeremy Herrin achieved in the performances of Gemma and, uh, and um, Gemma Jones and Penelope and Sam West were really remarkable, but um, the whole company, but it was, it was, I think that several of us found that the writing was very beautiful to read and to listen to, but to make galvanizing and dynamic in a sort of theatrical way it was a bit sort of like it felt like we were doing all the work so <coughs> it was lovely to work with my mum we didn't really have any scenes together but we got to share a dressing room and sort of hang out and it was really it was really lovely yeah it felt really normal <laughs> um and um but it was a sort of a strange play but I, I think yeah, what Jeremy Heron did, it was really beautiful and it sort of wove a really beautiful spell. But on the inside, it felt a bit like paddling furiously under the water to kind of try and make this thing actually move move forward and not just be a sort of piece of poetry, you know, read out. Very cool. Um, moving on from being part of the ensemble and the cast to playing the lead role, what was it like playing Nora in A Doll's House? And did you feel any sort of responsibility as the, the leading actor? Yeah. Um, I loved, God, I loved playing that part. Um, I was so thrilled to do it and I felt, I felt a responsibility of just like, I better not screw this up because it's the most extraordinary gift of a part. I can't think of many in the repertoire for women, especially who have that range. I mean, she literally runs the gamut of sort of every single, in a, in a sort of three day period of her life of every, she, she's so different with so many different characters. So it was the most extraordinary adventure. Um, and it was a really beautiful coming together. Um, so it just felt very serendipitous of a really um, lean and, um, I can't think of the right words to describe it, but Simon's ad Simon Stevens' adaptation, very sort of to the point and baggage free and uh, beautiful design, music, direction, cult, like everything just felt like we were all on the same tracks somehow. And um, it just meant that um, one could sort of trust the process and trust the the, the, the ship we were on and then fly and not feel sort of stressed or trying to deliver something which was, um, you know, it, the, uh, Katie Mitchell calls them solo flights. Like there were no solo flights where people are like, yeah, yeah, you know, screw the ensemble. I'm going to do my thing now, <laughs> you know, um, that we were just sort of in it together and serving this extraordinary play. And it was just so exciting because, um, I guess nor, nor is a character, everything happens to her. People just keep coming in. And so she, you, there was a sense like to start with, I was like, this is the most exhausting thing I've ever done. And then there was a release moment of just going, do you know what? I don't have the brain space to think ahead to what's going on. You just have to like, it's like going on a roller skater. You get in, the, not a, a roller coaster, get in at the beginning of the show, buckle up and just ride it. And as long as you kind of submit to what's happening and not look ahead, you're fine and you suddenly at the end of the play and you're like holy shit what's just happened you know um so that was just so thrilling to to get to inhabit such an amazing piece of writing and the response was really extraordinary and it seemed it the play seemed to really touch people and the conversations it um triggered were, were just absolutely fascinating um so oh it was a dream dream job and 
I often sort of think, oh God, you know, where, where are the parts like, like Nora, but you can't, you can't repeat it, but it was just, oh, I loved it. Yeah. Very happy. Like an amazing experience. Yeah. I mean, you've worked on so many different productions with many different casts and some incredible actors. Would you say that that was your your favourite production to be a part of, or are there others um, highly? I think in the end, um, I'm trying to think. God, I mean, every single job, there's something kind of wonderful that emerges from it. But that there was something about the journey that we all went on because it had such a long life. I think it was over three years. We kept doing it again. And I know in terms of my own, um, I, f I found it was a real breakthrough for me in terms of my practice. That sounds really wanky, but basically um, trust... Uh, Historically, I'd always been a very sort of, um, I had a danger of overworking material. So to try and get it right, I would work and work and work and work and try and kind of get, achieve the same thing every night. But with the result that, go, that's not the way to be free and to, to, um, to be in the moment on stage, you know. So there was a sense of just like going, oh, it's, you know, this, this thing I was saying earlier about, having a break from something, returning to it, having a break and just um, the deepening trust in the material, the deepening understanding of the material and the pleasure of playing something absolutely accurately, more and more accurately each time and honing in on what it, one felt Ibsen intended was really rewarding and um, taught me something about um, sort of one's craft, I guess. I felt like I, I got better as a performer because of that show. And so I feel I really owe it a huge deal. That sounds, yeah, fantastic. Mm. Um, coming on to Outnumbered, what was it like to work on a TV sitcom? And did you find that your theatre work prepared you for this or was it a very different skill set? You had to use like improvisation. Um, yes, Outnumbered um, was one of those jobs. It was so fun to do and it was, I think I did my first episode of it in 2000, 2009 or something, I'd, I'd, or 2008. I think I'd just filmed Sense and Sensibility, so I've got dark hair. And um, and then, of course, it, sort of, it was one of those returning ones. They kept ringing and saying, do you want to come back? And I was like, yes, please. That was great fun, you know. So um, uh, it did feel like a different skill set, I suppose. I mean... It's still about figuring out what makes the writing work and trying to deliver that and trying to fulfill what's required tonally. And, um, but I guess, I, for me, maybe it's just because theatre was my sort of first love and what I started doing. It took me a long, much longer time to um, feel confident or comfortable in a filming environment in terms of all the distractions. It's quite hard to explain. Like some people really don't seem to notice it, but just like, if you're used to just working in rooms of people and just doing the performance in this kind of cocoon in front of an audience, suddenly to be, to like, have all the, the paraphernalia of filming around you is, and the sort of, the pressure of sort of having to come up with it on the day. And if you don't get it that day, then you can't come back. I mean, you can do it over and over, but you can't return, you know, the next day and the next week's rehearsal and deepen it, or, you know, um, is, yeah, for a long time, I found that quite a challenge to sort of, to leap over. So therefore would, you know, just work my socks off to try and prep the work in a way that meant that I could deliver it and not be kind of phased by everything. Um, but, uh, it's yeah I, I mean oh god different and yet the same I don't I don't know it's a sort of similar prep but you've got to be you, you come in on the day and you don't know where you're going to be mm. saying the line so you've, you've got to remain very flexible and very um fluid with it and um and sort of ready to sort of respond to what the other person is doing and have a relationship with them which you you know you met when you just met or whatever instantly but the writing was such fun and the the guys doing it were, were so brilliant so it was it was it was a very friendly environment and very um 
low key and informal. So it was a, it was a really lovely way to do comedy compared to sort of you know those live audience shows or whatever like that. So um, yeah. yeah. Do you have a favourite moment or, or memory from your time um, on Outnumbered? Um, my character had to go through some really demeaning, like being completely drunk or vomiting or like on the toilet. <laughs> I don't see it on the toilet where. Oh my god! Well, you know, when it was broadcast, I was getting texts from all, all my friends going, "Hattie, the whole nation have just seen you on the loo." And I'm like, yes, thank you. Um, you know, or it was just kind of silly, like just a lot of it, just really silly. And often because you're acting with kids, and then they have to go off and do their schooling, so then you're acting with like, you know, an AD on their knees reading some lines, like you know, or a cross sticker on the wall, you know. So um, it's. I don't, it was, um, I quite enjoyed the episode where I kept having to vomit. It was just quite a fun thing to do and people looking at you was like, oh my God, you're disgusting. So that was quite enjoyable, but they were all fun. It's such a lovely gang of people. Yeah, um, yeah I'm really yeah. grateful. Wonderful. Um, moving on to Golden Compass. Mm. Had you previously read the books and did you feel a sort of pressure in adapting and, you know, having to live up to people's expectations of such you know, loved books. Yes, I had read the books. I was a huge fan. So that was really exciting to do. Um, again, I, I don't know, in terms of living up to the pressure, you just go, I mean, especially when you're, you know, I just played a, uh, a nurse at, I can't even remember the name of the place, the place up in the Arctic where they cut the demons away. I mean, it was just hideous. Um, and she was meant to be sort of slightly... I guess slightly lobotomized because she'd had a demon cut away. So it was just a matter, you, you, all you can do, you can't affect the overall thing. You have no influence over design or edit. You know, if you're playing a cog in, in one great hole of uh, something of that mm -hmm. scale. So you just go, what, what's needed here? How can I do it with as much integrity as I can? And with as much sort of, interest or wit or whatever it is you're trying to bring to it and just sort of just take charge of that and, and bring bring what you can in the moment so yeah I didn't feel a pressure because I sort of thought this is way bigger than any single one of us you know except yeah. maybe Bob Kidman or something like that but um it was it was just such fun to see see things of that scale I think that was the first thing I'd done of of scale where you can just you know you pinch yourself you step back and you're just like, I can just sit here and watch you all all day it's so interesting seeing these create these feats of imagination being brought to life yeah yeah it's incredible just amazing set and costume and everything mm. yeah it must have been amazing yeah um, and just moving on again to sense and sensibility had you watched any because obviously it's very heavily adapted had you ever watched other adaptations um before you got involved in it or did you try to approach it with a clean slate um, I had seen the Emma Thompson one years back. I mean, I guess it had been made maybe, oh, they come around every 10 years, is it? Eight, nine, 10 years, something like that. I don't know. So I had seen that and remembered it very beautifully, but I hadn't read the book until um, I got this new one. So I didn't go and watch any of the others because I thought that's, I didn't, I'm not sure that's helpful really. Mm. I don't know. So I'm sure some actors do it in a very thorough and go, well, I'm not going to do that. Or, you know, I just thought you, all you can do is bring your own instincts to a part. And um, yeah, so very much a, a clean slate, just responding to the book itself and the story. And um, I think Ellen is quite a gift for screen adaptation because, well, I don't, I say it's a gift. I mean, in the book, Jane Austen tells us what she's thinking, and of course, she's a complete poker face. <laughs> but there's sort of, if if you trust the director and the editor, then you sort of just go, well, as long as I'm feeling these things inside, hopefully, it's the it's the trick of going. The people in the room shouldn't pick up that I'm going. Oh, I'm dying inside, but you know, the viewers be like, ah, you know, I'm so clever, I can read her expression, you know. So it's a sort of um, a balance, and I think the the director and producer really helped me with that. Go all oh, less or more, you know. You don't, need, you know. So that was a, just a really interesting um, education for me in terms of working on screen and figuring out what um, what was needed. Moving on to another 
book adaptation. Mm. You played Queen Elsmere in Alice Through the Looking Glass. Had did you sort of reference the books for that, or did you just go on this new whole sort of? Well, movie? I don't know if you've seen the films, but there's very little <laughs> to do with the books. <laughs> <laughs> they're a new, they're a creation unto themselves. Those books. Funny enough, I recently did, did the audio book of Through the Looking Glass and I was reading it going, I don't remember any of this. This is completely different. No, so they're, they're, they're a standalone um, confection, sounds really demeaning. They're, they're kind of a creation. Again, so much artistry and imagination and the world that's being conjured before your eyes. So it was it was huge fun um and i was just bowled over by i think the design and the costume departments i just get such a thrill from talking to them and you know there's there's fittings because i was playing the queen i mean i could buy a small property with what they were spending on, on my dresses it was amazing and shoes made in Italy for me specifically sent over in several different colors that probably wouldn't weren't even on the screen I mean it was sort of out just outrageous but sort of beautiful and the integrity and the vision of the costume designer was just so and her team I was just in awe of so that was um something really 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 just enjoyable to encounter you know that kind of excellence that those films draw together and um, the sort of the the ultimate power of, of the Disney machine. They were working so hard. I was only on it here and there, you know, but the, they were sort of working till 10 every night and up at six. And I mean, it was sort of awesome, Ge genuinely awesome to behold. Yeah. It is. It's an amazing film to watch. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with, like, which cast members did you get to work with? Because it is a... I worked on that. Um... Well, I worked, there was flashbacks where I worked with the girls who played the Red and White Queen when they were little. So I did some stuff with the kids, which was really lovely. And then the, there was a big court scene with Helena Bonham Carter and Anne Hathaway. And um, I think Reese Ifans popped up and I think Johnny Depp, oh, I can't, can't even remember. But I, it was mainly hanging out with, with Helena and, and Anne Hathaway sort of I say hang out with we're all just on a stage you know making small talk and Helena offering us chocolate basically as far as I can remember and oh and um the the king um oh god I've forgotten his name terrible <laughs> very lovely actor very deep voice very handsome very sexy um he was the king and um so yeah it's great you kind of you encounter these people very briefly and they're all super cool super nice and you know you sort of try and do what's required on the day. And it's very odd because it just takes so long. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much money that they can shoot every single angle that they might do on every single person's face. So like a week later, you're still doing the same sequence. <laughs> you're thinking like, am I, am I, is my face doing the same thing? I feel like I'm literally, you know, I'm morphing into a sort of strange claymation model. But um, so that's, it has its own challenges you know, compared to something like Outnumbered where there's no lighting and you just sort of do it a few times and then you move on. So the, the lack of rehearsal on one versus the over and over and over and over of the other feel very different and require each require their own sort of skills, essentially. Mm. Well, I guess moving from one mammoth Disney project onto another, um, you were the enchantress in Beauty and the Beast. Did you like enjoy playing that character and did you try and move away from that sort of classic stereotype of the, the Um That was, yeah, that was lovely. I'd worked with the director actually, Bill Condon, on a film the year before. So it was really lovely to be asked to come back. Um, although <laughs> there was a particular, I don't know, I was like, I'm playing it like a, I'm playing a Disney enchantress. And then you look at the script and you're like, for three seconds, I'm glowing and rather wonderful and ethereal looking. For the whole film, I look like a hag with the plague, basically. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the makeup department like, we really need to make you look even worse, even worse. Can we put some like sores on your face? And yeah, they got to the stage and I was like, okay guys, you finished, you know. Um, it was, yeah, something with, with something of that scale, there's a story. Everyone knows the cartoon so well. The amount of 
producers and direct, you know, the director sort of shaping the story. So it's very much, you can bring what you can to it and you try and bring a sort of an integrity and a coherence to the journey of the character. But a lot of it's going to be, a lot of the story is being told in the edit, the music, um, and the design tells a huge story. So there's sort of, you, again, you feel like you're just one part of an enormous um, collective um, and you try and, you know, bring your service um, to the table in as best as way you can and sort of see what happens. But it was, um, yeah, you get, you get a buzz from, from, you know, working with such incredible people and um, witnessing again, the, the artistry and the hard work and the kind of passion involved. There was so much passion and love for the material and Bill Condon, the director was just the most wonderful human being. So that really felt like it was being led with the right feeling, like led with such heart, which was wonderful. Yeah. Well, moving on from the, the magical to the real, you mm. played um, Yvonne Ridley, who's a real person in Official Secrets. What was that like? And did you ever get to meet her or discuss the character? No, I didn't. Um, I just sort of read about her as much as I could and she's still sort of very active and you know on Twitter and things like that and I don't know really um again it felt like the scene was it had its function and I just wanted to try and get her voice right and so to be honest there wasn't a huge opportunity to to bring something incredibly nuanced it was just about kind of telling the right story and delivering that moment. Um, and I was sort of, I was a bit sort of uncertain to what extent she was known in this country in terms of uh, not necessarily her involvement in that uh, UCHQ whistleblowing story, but um, her own journey. And, you know, there's a particular view of her that gets sort of repeated at, you know, the sort of Fleet Street offices um, in the film, but it's sort of, I was just really interested to sort of research her and that particular journey she'd been on, which was kind of extraordinary. Um, you could make a whole film about her. <laughs> but of course, in that moment, I was like, but right now I'm giving some information to someone at a car park. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on and trust that people can look in my eyes and go, wow, what a story. <laughs> you know, you do with, you have to deal with what you're given. <laughs> Well, out of all those, like, such a wide range of characters, do you have a favourite screen character that you On screen? Um, I mean, Outnumbered was a lot of fun. I, the, I think I have a huge love for a project that I did in Northern Ireland um, back in 2016. Um, it was a BBC series called My Mother and Other Strangers. And it was just a really, it was a lead role and the writing was really unusual and really nuanced. And um, when you live with a character for sort of five episodes or something, you really get to um, sort of live and breathe them and, and have the opportunity to tell different aspects of the personality. And um, it was a tremendous team and I adored the director and the cast I was working with. So that was just, um, a very, very happy, happy time. Yeah, and something I feel very proud of. So, um, but it's, I don't know, they're also different uh, for different reasons. Yeah, but from a sort of artistic point of view, I'd say that was the most rewarding of recent. I mean, Sense and Sensibility was really amazing, but it feels quite a long time ago. So um, I think, I don't know if I'd approach it differently now, I sort of feel quite a different person and a different actor from when I did it then, so. I'm just looking forward, just before we start to open our um, Q&A up, do you have, do you think that the future of um, theatre or film will be impacted heavily by the corona situation? Like, what do you think that the future holds for theatre and film? Well, today's news about the government um, funding, is a combination of grants and, <sighs> so relieved, um, grants and loans feels 
so welcome and such a relief. I was just, um, <clears throat> yeah, properly, properly frightened about the prospect of, of who would survive and who wouldn't. And it's not just about what, what companies can get through or what buildings can get through, but it was what will, will the vision have become restricted or tightened because of economic imperatives. And, you know, if there's so little money about and people are so desperate to get bums on seats, will it just re return to a thing of, you know, the biggest name, the most well-known play done in the most you know, commercial way possible. And I guess there was a sense of a, a fear of a reduction of um, vision and a reduction of diversity. And um, so I hope that it's, it's made people have a period of reflection in terms of producers and directors and writers, a period of reflection and makes people go, well, what do we want our theatre to be? Who do we want it to be for? And um, yeah, I suppose, um, I, I really hope that that thinking time leads into something which is, is truly representative and um, isn't afraid to take risks. That would be my fear is that returning and hopefully this, <clears throat> this government bailout will enable people to kind of have a bit of, you know, shoulders back and like we can actually do this confidently rather than in a sort of desperate panicky situation. Um, and, and just not pulling back on opportunities for um, young people or people, people who wouldn't normally come into theatres, just trying to open up, open up the dish, open up the audiences, who comes into theatres, whose stories get told. So that, that sort of thing, I feel, I, I feel hopeful that there's been so much dialogue and debate about it that it'll lead to some really great sort of rethinking of the, of the, um, the book. I don't know what the book is, but <laughs> that's how I'm going to phrase it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. We're going to open up our Q&A now. So um, everyone who's watching, if you could just type into the Q&A function, any questions that you have. And just while we're waiting, uh, we'll ask our final question, which is, do you have any TV, film, or even theatre recommendations to fill our lockdown summers? Um, I guess people have been all watching the same thing. Everyone's probably caught up on succession and normal people by now, which are both amazing. Um, I'm halfway through. I. I Will Destroy You, which I think is amazing. Mm. Um, there's a lot of streamed theatre I keep missing and I keep sort of trying to, it's the perils of sort of having a small child that you sort of never quite are on top of timetables as much as you'd like to be. Um, there's a, Sadler's Wells are doing it through July, I think. I haven't seen it yet, but this ver version of Pina Bausch's Rites of Spring on a beach in Senegal, I think, which is meant to be extraordinary. Um, and I want to see, oh, what are we, yeah. We're, we're, we're watching some things on TV, but it's a bit sporadic. What was the, I'm not okay with this. I thought it was great. Russian doll I'm enjoying. <laughs> I don't know, these are quite random, but um, yes. I wish I'd had in another version of, lo I think lockdown, pre-parenthood and post-parenthood is so different not that I experienced it before but I keep having waking up and going my god I could be learning a language or catching up on the entire oeuvre of some filmmaker and instead I'm like I've watched 10 minutes of television today and it was mostly aimed at three-year-olds so it's a light <laughs> and I've read this much of a book I've read some poems <laughs> so yeah sadly it's a bit thin on the ground for recommendations mm -hmm. Take what you can. <laughs> um, our first question is, how do you deal with projection and do you have any tips on how to move forward? Um, um, the immediate thought that came into my head was <laughs> go to a cafe and buy an enormous piece of pastry. Was <laughs> I remember doing that after an audition where I was like, I think I really screwed that up. I went and got the pastry and then I got the call the next day, I got it. I was like, shit, I shouldn't have been eating that pastry. <laughs> so stupid. Anyway, um, don't do that. It's obviously really um, inane. Um, oh God, there's no way. I mean, 
I think it helps if you try separate your own self-esteem from the industry to put it bluntly there are so many factors into why you may or may not get something and it's so rarely to do with are you can you actually deliver a performance it's going to be more so in screen but it's more it's to do with how you look whether they feel you have the right vibe with the other person how tall you are sometimes like really sort of random things like that Mm -hmm. um whether the director's worked with someone else before. Um, so it's a very, you have to play mind games. You have to sort of want something so much that you, that you sort of prepare as passionately as you can, but in the room be sort of laissez-faire enough that it doesn't look like you're desperate. And then as soon as you walk out, drop it so that if you don't get it, you know. so you're constantly sort of kidding your brain and jumping through hoops to try and keep your sanity around it um but yeah i'd say try and disconnect your own sense of worth and self-esteem from the industry if you're able to and um look on it as sort of one big journey rather than you know yes there can be jobs which are big breaks but equally every you never know every you know the path you're on you know, you sort of, sometimes you sort of think, well, there must have been a reason. If I don't get that, something else will be really interesting or something interesting will happen in my life. And, you know, try and look at it as a, as a, as a one big journey, I think. And, and don't compare yourself to with everyone else. I think that's mm. lethal. Mm. There's only one you and it's completely pointless saying, oh, but look, so-and-so is doing this or so-and-so is doing that. They're, they're a different person. They do something different. Thank you. That's, yeah, fantastic advice. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a question here which asks, are there any other of Ibsen's women that you'd like to play? And how do you work to make sure that his characters are sympathetic or relatable to a modern audience? Um, yes, I suppose there are. I mean, I was talking with a director recently. We've had an idea of doing Enemy of the People, but doing a gender swap. And of course, then it was done and Alex Kingston did it. And we're like, damn got my first <laughs> um that would be really exciting ibsen's got great women all the way up the age range i don't know if i might have passed the header i don't know header obviously she's fun um and lady from the sea and later john gabriel borkman you know that hopefully in my retiring years <laughs> um but in terms of sympathetic i sort of go that's not your job he's such an a, accomplished playwright that he allows for that within the structure of the plays I mean I, I know obviously I know Doll's House best but like Nora's meant to be super annoying and maddening and like a complete bitch at times and like superficial and you're like what is this awful person and then you you start to understand her and you understand her predicament and you go oh maybe I would be like that if I'd had that upbringing or had gone through what she's gone through and so I I think it's it's easier said than done but try not to get stressed about being likable and sympathetic because his writing is so complex and multifaceted and that's why it's so extraordinary from someone of his era to write parts for women which aren't um, clearly cut heroines or villainesses, you know, that they're just really complicated, psychologically like screwed up, but kind of really interesting and compelling people and honor all those different elements of them. And it's not your responsibility to make them likable. Mm. Also, likable to sympathetic, but sympathetic just be try and be truthful to yeah simple i think if 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 you're truthful to the humanity of a character then it, they will be by their nature be sympathetic because you re- people recognize fellow humans um i think this will have to be our last question but it's a perfect last question um they asked do you have any dream roles in plays or on screen which you would particularly want to play Um, yes, I mean, I suppose there are, um, I'm trying to think, <laughs> I'm trying to think, it's that weird thing where you on the spot. Planet, planet pandemic has sort of 
<laughs> you know, so I'm going, I've been living the state of going, maybe there'll never be any theatre ever again. Um, I've always wanted to have a go at Beatrice in Much Ado. Um, and, you know, it's something interesting, like Cleopatra is obviously an astonishing part and a total dream. I always grew up thinking I would love to play it. And actually I go, I don't think I should be cast as Cleopatra. It's, it's not right to have a white middle-class actress play Cleopatra. So I don't, I wouldn't cast me as Cleopatra. Um, and that's the classic, let me think. Um, but I'm also, yeah, okay, so I also, that yeah, there'll be lots of, there'll be lots of parts, but it's, it's not just about like, oh, I have to play this part. It's gonna be about who's doing it, who's the team, what's the vision? And also there's something rather fun about being presented with something you've never thought of or a new piece of writing that has sort of ingredients that you'd never encountered before rather than having a bucket list, I suppose. And I suppose the danger with getting set on a bucket list is if they don't materialize then you sort of have regrets. So I don't know, I get, I, let's see if one can submit to the randomness of um, what comes along, then great. But um, there are things which would be great joy to do, but I, you know, one isn't set on them. I think that's a, a good way to approach it. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for, but thank you so, so much, Hattie, for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time. And thank you to everyone else who joined the call and asked amazing questions. Thank you. Please like our Facebook page for more updates um, and please do register for our interview with Michelle King, who's the Director of Inclusion at Netflix, which is on Wednesday, July the 8th at 7pm in collaboration with Untangling the Knot. And thank you again so much, Hattie, for your time. <laughs>